Otto Essendo stars in The Diplomat on Netflix. I'm David Buchanan with Gold Derby. Otto, you play the deputy chief of station on the series. Mm -hmm. How much did you know about that role prior to joining the show and reading the scripts? Absolutely nothing. In fact, uh, saying deputy chief of mission was even hard to say like I knew what I was talking about. So I had I was starting at ground zero, basically. So what what did your prep work look like? Because obviously the series is so complex in terms of the diplomacy and the international relations that it's grappling with. But um, I just have to imagine, you know, you could do so much extensive research. So what what were your resources and how did you prepare to take on the role as Stuart? Well, I, I, I've, I've played characters that have a lot of jargony things to say. And the thing about jargon is you have to practice the jargon. You have to practice, for example, deputy chief of mission. So you can say it like you sound like you know what you're talking about. Um, and then there's the research that you can do, like read um, works from different ambassadors to sort of get an idea of what the the job is and what their day-to-day -day life looks like. And uh, one of the books that uh, Deborah Khan gave us to read was uh, called The Ambassadors. Um, and it, it, it recounts key diplomatic sort of ambassadors and people in the world and like the lives that they've lived from, you know, living in a yurt somewhere with, a you know, some tribal elders to try to get them to talk to each other or being in some place as splashy and as glitzy as the London, uh, the U.S. Embassy in London, like we portray in our show. Um, what I was struck by, though, which I as a, as a p sort of minor political junkie that I didn't realize was how much work goes into every single decision that is made politically or geopolitically. And um, there's a, a documentary that I saw as well called um, The Human Factor, which if you haven't seen it, you've got to go watch that because um, it is so emotionally compelling that like I've watched it twice crying as if I'm watching like a really good movie that's dramatic. Um, and it uh, it recounts the uh, Israel and Palestinian peace accord that happened during the Clinton administration. And it talks about all the people that were in the background just to get, you know, Yitzhak Rabin to shake hands with Yasser Arafat. I remember that, I think, in high school or college when it happened. And I remember how momentous that moment was, but I had no idea what went into that meeting and getting all of those peace talks to actually happen. And that's a 30-year project. It's not a week. Well, I'm going to call Yitzhak Rabin and see if he wants to talk to Yasser Arafat. No. And in the middle of it, poor Yitzhak Rabin is assassinated. And so they have to start over again with a new Israeli prime minister. And they still are able to get some stuff done. And then tragically, it all falls apart. Um, and there's a speech that um, Rufus Sewell's character gives in this um, in this television show um, as Hal Weiler. He's brilliant in this. And uh, he talks about the frustrations of being in the diplomatic service because you're always making mistakes. You're always making mistakes and missteps and you're, you're falling three and four and five and 12 steps behind. And then finally you get one chance, one opportunity and something is not a maybe, it's not a no, it's a yes and then let's go forward and see where that takes us. And I realize all of the things that these people are doing, you must care. You have to care in the idealness of being a human being on this planet and sharing space. And I think that I have a much higher respect for the Foreign Service than I already had. And now I'm amazed that anybody can do this job, much less an actor trying to portray somebody doing the job. Yeah, I can't imagine that's such a great way to kind of frame, you know, what what's going on and what the series is attempting to depict with a really lovely ensemble yeah. and just the many, many people, you know, that, that the ensemble is standing in for. Yeah. Um, one thing I love about Stuart, I mean, I really do feel like your character, Stuart, is so lovable. <laughs> um, I mean, he is he is so knowledgeable and calming and obviously brilliant. Mm -hmm. um, what was it about Stuart when you first heard about the character from Deborah or first read those early scripts? What really jumped off the page about Stuart for you and really drew you to the project? Well, at Stuart, as in all the characters were, first of all, intimidating because of all of the things that they're saying and because of how smart, intelligent they are and how quick they are in thought. And 
knowing Deborah's work, I was already intimidated, but having a conversation with her, she said, you have to remember these people are experts in doing what they do, but they're also human beings. They also have foibles. They also make mistakes. They also fall in love. They are fully fleshed out three-dimensional characters. So there is not one character in this script that I've read that I wouldn't want to play as an actor. Even the day players on that come on for you know one or two days, one or two scenes, have really compelling things to do. And so it's a, it's a no-brainer to want to do a project like that because everybody, I think, in the acting world wants to have at least one shot at, at doing a, a, such a fully fleshed out role in a fully fleshed out show. So that's a rarity and I'm lucky to be part of it. Yeah, and you bring so much to it and so much to the oh, role. I appreciate um, that. <laughs> I want to ask you about uh, one very early scene. I think it's in the very first episode. We mm -hmm. see a character. I, I don't remember who off the top of my head, but mm -hmm. a character refers to Stuart, your character, as a kingmaker. Mm -hmm. I just thought that was such an interesting early kind of introduction to the character and really forms how we see him and how we perceive him going forward. What do the details like that tell you about him? Because I feel like that is such, we do learn a bit of the backstory and I'll ask you about it, but you know, those kind of early kind of details, what, how does that help you kind of digest who you're playing and step into their shoes? Yeah, I, on first blush, when you when I looked at the character before I really started talking to Deb and what her plans were for that character, there's a, there's a certain, like you said, there's a calmness of it, there's a the ability, there's an unflappableness to that character. But Deb says just because he's a nice guy and he's a seemingly nice guy who's trying to, you know, sort of mend fences everywhere, he recognizes and understands power in a way that's more powerful than the actual people in power. Because the people who move the people in power, the people who are the kingmakers, have the true power, right? Because the king has to stand there, and of course you can kill a king, and then you get another king. Now who puts that next king there? The kingmaker. And so that made me really understand how powerful Stuart was in his way, and how he chooses to access power and use it. He because he's in the diplomatic service, he uses what we call soft power, which is like, I don't have a gun, I don't have a knife, but I have the ability to, um, uh, to sort of convince and to sort of bring you to a table and, and get you to start negotiating with things. And so that's something that is quite lovely to try to play and try to realize as an actor looking at a character like this. Absolutely. Let's talk about some of your relationships on the series. Mm. You're obviously extremely close and have to form a real rapport with Kate, the mm -hmm. new uh, American diplomat, played, of course, by Kerry Russell. Mm -hmm. Talk about um, their dynamic. What is his very first impression of Kate when she steps off that plane and they start to work, work together? And I just love the way, too, um, that the relationship unfolds over the course of eight episodes. So talk about you know, his first impression and how that might change over over the series. I think his first impression is she's a mess and she's not capable to do the job that she's being asked to do now, which is be the front facing ambassador to something as Tiffany and as sort of um, uh, glamorous as the the US ambassador in the UK. That's a hugely glamorous part. And this this woman doesn't even know how to comb her hair, right? And so what he starts to understand is what he wants in life is to find somebody as a kingmaker who is not just a political animal, but who actually wants to use power for good. And I think he starts to recognize that the, he, he already recognizes how capable as she is just because of her own experience before she comes to the UK, but she can actually be somebody who can make change and not hold down to power in a way that destroys everything else. And like, I think he sees her as like his hope and the hope of the world by the time we get to the end of the series, but it's Rocky in the beginning. He's like, oh, she's a mess. She's a hot mess. <laughs> Yeah, I think he's absolutely right on that. Um, but there's also, in part of uh, that Rocky dynamic, there's a moment in the second episode that I just love, and as an audience member, really kind of puts me back on my heels where he's kind of made a bit of a blunder and she asks for his resignation. Oh. And it's a really serious beat mm -hmm. until she says, you know, of, just as a formality, of course. Yes. Um, just loved, I love the way you played that. I love mm -hmm. the way it unfolds. Talk about those moments, you know, kind of finding the equilibrium with 
with Kate and talk about working with Carrie on building this because obviously the two of you, the rapport that you build uh, and the chemistry on screen is is so incredible. Oh, that's great. I mean, uh, I have to give it up to Carrie because, um, you know, I've I've been a fan of hers for the longest time since Felicity. Let's you know, let's 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 call it. She's been around for that long, and usually the parts that I've seen her play are very serious and very dramatic. But what I what I never knew until I met her and started working with is she is a comic animal. She is incredible at comedy. She's very funny. Um, and so that moment that you're talking about is one of my favorite moments to, to have played and to have been in because it comes out of nowhere, right? And it's an indication to Stuart that this woman is way more capable and way more savvy than he's giving her credit for. Just that little moment. And I think to give it up to Deborah Khan as well, she is great at putting these little character nuggets in the show, these little breadcrumbs that lead you to the end that keep you watching because every single moment is a key to what these characters, their motivations are, what they want, what they don't want, the secrets that they're keeping. So it's it's great to watch these relationships develop and that's one of those key moments where in Stuart's mind, he's like, oh, she is a political animal. She understands politics. She just doesn't want to use politics in that way, which is which is one of those things that makes it enlightening for him to sort of realize what he has uh, in Kate Weiler. Yeah, yeah. And speaking of relationships, I feel like Stuart is third party to the marriage at the heart of the series uh, between <laughs> Kate and Hal. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the, the kind of dynamics of the three of them, especially the headaches that Hal creates for Stuart, yeah. are so interesting to see, you know, the kind of uh, untangling those knots yeah. Talk about working with Rufus Sewell too. Um, the three of you uh, make such an interesting trio throughout yeah. the course of the the season. Talk about finding that kind of dynamic as a trio, because mm -hmm. obviously, you know, each of these kind of pairs have different dynamics. But when you put the three of you together, you know, it's something entirely different and and equally fun to watch. Yeah, Rufus is also somebody that I've always been a fan of for the longest time, and I've always seen him do dramatic things, and he's looking in the camera, and the, the you know he's. But I didn't realize how funny he's comedian level funny. You know, when you just meet him, he's just so affable and so funny and so down to earth. Um, so for me to answer your question, I just get out of their way because to me, I, maybe I'm blowing them up too much. But Rufus and Carrie together remind me of Moonlighting. Remember that show back in the day with Bruce Willis and uh, oh my God, uh, I can't remember her name, blonde woman. But they had. Blonde woman, sorry, but uh, they. I, I'm uh, good. Sybil Shepherd. Sybil, Sybil Shepherd, Shepherd, thank you so much. But they had that level of chemistry that you couldn't stop watching them. So as a person in the middle of that, you have to figure, you have to pick your shots because you're trying to manage these two people and the stakes are so much higher. And so I think it just comes naturally by just being around Rufus and Carrie playing Kate and Hal. And it's it's just easy. I just stand there and say my lines, really. <laughs> and, and the moments happen because everybody's so organic and so ready to work. So it's it, my job is easy. Maybe their job is hard, but mine is easy. One of my favorite things of the series, too, are the really large ensemble scenes mm -hmm. and the long kind of protracted diplomatic discussions. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think the show does those really well, mm -hmm. and they're so gripping. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering, though, since they're, I, I imagine they're long shoots, they're many pages, mm -hmm. and it's a large ensemble, just talk about if and how, I know you're a theater actor, you have, you know, a lot of experience on stage. Mm -hmm. How does that kind of um, background and experience help you on this show where you're dealing with a lot of dialogue, long scenes, and mm -hmm. really complicated scenes with many players? Yeah, I hadn't done theater in a long time. And when you're playing with this kind of dialogue and it, it, you really need an actor who is ready to work and who has that kind of um, um, uh, intelligence and understanding of the craft because it takes a lot of stamina. Those scenes, when you're seeing a scene of like all of us sitting around a table, those scenes take hours to shoot. 
and we're in these old English manors that don't have the greatest air conditioning. Do you know what I mean? And it's in, in when we were shooting during, during the summer in Britain, it was an unseasonably hot summer. And so you really, number one, have to have the stamina to be able to like do these scenes over and over again for each different angle, but also know how to let loose in between scenes to like let off the steam so you can rest a little bit. And everybody in the cast is like that. We, we aren't people who, um, have to stay in character the whole time. We can make a joke and then they call action and then start the scene because it loosens you up in a way to be feel like you're comfortable and you belong in a scene rather than the stiffness that you start getting when you're really nervous about getting this line right. And uh, I, I give credit to everybody in the cast because we're all a laid back bunch of goofballs. So it makes the job very, very easy. Yeah, another facet of the character that I love is his home life. Um, we get mm -hmm. to see his uh, Stuart's relationship with Idra, mm -hmm. who's the CIA station chief in London, mm -hmm. played by Ali An. Mm -hmm. um, I love their dynamic. I love where their relationship goes as the season unfolds. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about, you know, what does Stuart see in Idra? Why, why do you think they're such a good pair um, and working with Ali? She's... Number one, gorgeous. Number two, smart. Number three, successful. Like, like, like that's just easy, right? <laughs> so uh, Ali as a person is great to work with, but Idra, the character, like who wouldn't want to be with somebody like that? I think it's... um. I think when you're working at that high level or whatever job you have, the only options you have are the people that you're working with. And so if there's any kind of spark between these two people with a lot of power, something can happen. They have to navigate this very carefully for their own reasons because, you know, office romances are sort of frowned upon and you shouldn't do that. There's all of these other things that you have to consider when you're working in the Foreign Service. And she's part of the CIA. You don't know what they, they know. You don't know what she has on you. Um, and so it makes it a really fun dynamic to try to play because I think they really, really care for each other, but they've never really put a relationship before their job. And so how do you navigate that? Um, and that that go that anybody watching that could understand that you don't have to work in the foreign service to understand that you can be a lawyer, you can be anything. Work in the office, and you you're attracted to somebody. You guys decide to decide to start dating. How does that look in the office or on the field, wherever you are? And so th there's so much to play with that that it's like you can you can just base a show just on that relationship or any of the relationships in the show. Yeah, no question. Um, before I let you go, Otto, yeah. one question, mm -hmm. one final question yeah. on the ending of the of the season. Mm -hmm. um, no spoilers for people who haven't seen it yet. Yep. We won't get into it. But I just wanted to ask you, how did you feel when you read those kind of closing scenes for the first time? And what do you hope or kind of sets up for a potential season two? You know, mm -hmm. where do you hope to see, you know, the story uh, go from here? When you look at something like that, um, the way these scripts are are written as the actors, we can't wait until the next script comes out. That's how we were shooting this entire season. Um, and so when you see how Deborah Khan has chosen to end it, all I want to know is what happens next and hopefully that we all survive to get to the next part. Because, you know, I've, I've said this a few times today where, you know, as an actor doing a series, you have your own input into where you want the character to go. But I realized early on, I'm not going to have a better idea than Deborah Khan does. So let me just shut up and wait to see what she comes up with and just accept it and say, yes, ma'am, and uh, continue to act. Otto Estendo, congratulations on the first season of The Diplomat. Thank you so much for talking to Gold Derby today. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Mm -hmm.